This video is all about MIP maps. We'll look at what they are and how to best visualize them. We'll see why MIP maps are needed. We'll look at the full range of minification filter functions that are available to us in WebGL. We'll look at how MIP maps are created, and we'll try creating them ourselves manually. Honestly, I'm kind of not sure why I'm making such a long video on this. In most projects, MIP maps come down to a couple lines of code, but I find the whole thing kind of interesting. So for what it's worth, here it is. This is how MIP maps are normally represented in most WebGL tutorials, either as a flat image, maybe in a spiral, or as a pyramid. These visualizations are useful for showing what MIP maps look like to us humans, and they're helpful for understanding how they might be laid out in memory. At the bottom of our MIP map series is our original image at full size, and each level above that, the dimensions shrink by half. The series ends when we get down to a single pixel. A 4K image could have 12 levels, a 1K image could have 10, and a 256 by 256 image would have just 8. Those pixel dimensions are great and all, but if you watched my last video on textures, hopefully you'll remember that WebGL doesn't see texture images as having a pixel size or rows and columns or pixel coordinates. To WebGL, a texture image's width and height are a constant. They're always one. Its horizontal coordinates range from 0 to 1. Its vertical coordinates range from 0 to 1. So the visualization I keep in my head is more like this. With each step up, the UV size of the texture remains the same, but each pixel's share of the space gets bigger. Each pixel represents a larger and larger portion of the original image. And actually, the whole idea of pixels seemed to lose its meaning when, you, when you're working with MIP maps and floating point UV coordinates. So instead, it's more common to talk about these pixels as texture elements, or texels. In the case of our original image here, which is 1024 by 1024, at level 0, each texel represents one one millionth of that texture image. At level 5, where the image is 32 by 32, each texel represents a thousandth of the image. At level 9, each texel represents a quarter. And at level 10, one texel represents the entire image. It's basically an average of every pixel in the base image. Okay, great. So we have these levels and texels, but how are they used, and why does WebGL need them? For this, it really helps to look at what happens without MIP maps. Here is the worst case scenario. High contrast, only two colors, thin straight lines, only horizontal and vertical. Looks great like this, until around here we notice that some lines look a little too thin, and around here some lines simply just vanish. And the situation gets even stranger when you add in 3D models and perspective changes. What's happening here is that our texture elements have become too small for our canvas pixels. In some places, a pixel on our canvas has to represent both line texels and background texels. Our sampler has to pick one, and sometimes, obviously, it chooses poorly. What would really help in this situation would be if there was some way to boost the size of our texture elements and make the job of choosing a better pixel color easier. And so, MIP maps were introduced to do just that, to make bigger texels that better represent the original source image. Now that we have them, WebGL's job is to figure out which level has the texels big enough to cover each canvas pixel. Occasionally, one level will exactly cover a pixel, but usually one level will be just a little bit too small, and the next one up will be a little bit too big. So you end up with a level number more like 4.29 where MIP map level 4 is just a little too small and MIP map level 5 is just a little too big. But as you'll see in a minute, it doesn't really matter if you don't have a nice round integer for your level value. To get MIP maps happening in your application, you have two options. By far the easiest is to have WebGL generate them for you. This is done using GL generate MIP maps. 
generate MIP maps is available to you after you've bound to one of these four texture targets and after you've uploaded a base image. In all of our examples so far, we've been using Texture 2D as our target, so that's what we'd specify here. If you're unclear on what targets are, I have an entire video on that. Link in the description. Now that we've got our MIP maps, you'll also want to choose a minification filter function. This is one of six internal functions that WebGL will use whenever a texture element is smaller than the pixel. In our last video on textures, because we weren't using MIP maps, we had only two options, GL nearest and GL linear. GL nearest snaps to the texel color at that UV coordinate, and GL linear gives a weighted average of the texels immediately surrounding the UV coordinate. We can still use those exact same functions here, but if we did, we wouldn't be using MIP maps, so there's not much point. So instead, here, we'll want to use one of these new functions. You'll notice that all these names are just nearest and linear repeated twice. And if you're a normal person, you might look at these for the first time and think to yourself, huh? Or, or maybe you'd think, what? So, yeah, me too. But honestly, I think they named these pretty well, and they're really easy to keep straight in your head once you see what they're doing. First, anywhere that you see GL nearest or GL linear, it's talking about a single texture image and a UV coordinate. Doesn't really have anything to do with MIP maps or levels or anything like that. And as you can see, this calculation is common to every type of minification calculation, with or without MIP maps. But if you are using MIP maps, the next question becomes which MIP map image or images does this calculation apply to? So this is where MIP map nearest or MIP map linear come in. It's talking about what you want done at the MIP map level. MIP map nearest will ignore all other levels and just use the image closest to that level. If it's 4.29, then it will only consider MIP map level 4. On the other hand, MIP map linear will consider the two images around the MIP map level and blend the result. So if it's 4.29, it will mostly use the results from MIP map level 4, but it will also include a bit from those from level 5. We can visualize this too, but in order to do this, first I need to show you how to directly populate your own MIP map levels without using GL Generate MIP map. We took a look at Tax Image 2D in our last video. It takes this basic form, and that second argument there, level, that's for specifying the MIP map level. If you do go this route, you need to run this function for all levels of your texture image. And WebGL is quite particular about this. If our source image is 250 by 250, that would go at level 0. And then level 1, it would be 125 by 125. Half that again, and you get to 62. Not 62.5. You can't have half a pixel, so when you have to round, you have to round down. So then it's 31 by 31, then 15 by 15, then 7 by 7, 3 by 3, and 1 by 1. Do all that, and you're done. As you can see, you don't have to use power of two dimensions in your texture images. Back in WebGL 1, you had to, but not anymore. Internally, WebGL simply pads out the images until they are power of two anyways. For that reason, I just stick to power of two image sizes anyways, but there's no strong technical reasons I've heard that you should do it this way. Okay, so why don't we use this now to visualize what a MIP map level actually looks like? Let's use our grid texture here. We'll generate MIP maps, but then replace one MIP map level. Let's do it for level four. We'll replace it with a solid color. And this is what it looks like. With MIP map nearest, you can see how there's a hard boundary separating level four from its neighboring levels. It's less visually obvious, but there's a hard boundary between all MIP map levels when you use this setting. And with MIP map linear, you can see how the texels of level 4 blend seamlessly with the levels around it. One thing I really want to point out here, notice here how the 
purple texels never take up more than 50% of the final render. Now let's try this again, but with a smaller canvas. Everything else will be the same. Now the entire canvas is covered by level 4 texels. Unless you're building something for a very specific piece of hardware, like maybe a kiosk, never assume that what you see on your monitor will be the same as what someone sees on theirs. And this is especially true for mobile devices. When in doubt, test everything. Finally, let's close out this video by looking at what things look like if we give every MIPMAP level its own solid color. Take a look at what happens with each minification function. Remember that these colors represent only the MIPMAP level. The source images for each level are just a solid color.